not catching fades anymore. Gotta keep my hands clean when they come for the bar. Keep it smooth like a dawn, making moves in the dark. Cause I learned how to swim in the pool for the sharks. Now they coaches, cause they can't read all his motions. How the kid never switch codes, but he codes with his focus. Staring down your team with a frozen, ice cold look that can end the summer solstice. Cause I'm more like the top dog. Keep on running game and the gang will accost y'all. I be calling players from a plane while I'm off court. But we ain't the same. You were lame. I'm a mob star. Top dog on a stat sheet, off court, but I call plays for the athletes, when the cop cars try to catch me, cause I rolled off in a taxi, with my feet up, I'm relaxing, singing Figaro with no accent, while I pull strings from the streets in, do it all with a straight face, I'm the king. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the BT Sports Studio. It's another edition of Cage Warriors Unplugged. My name's Brad Ward. I'm joined here this evening by Cage Warriors President Graham Boylan. Graham, it's been a busy start to 2023 already. We've had some fantastic sellout shows. And of course, the guys selling out those shows are the fantastic Cage Warriors roster. I believe seven new members of the roster debuting tonight. Just talk about how stacked this Cage Warriors roster is right now. It's a huge roster, Brad. We've got seven guys debuting tonight, and this is their showcase. This is the, this is the platform where they get to show us what they've got to do and what, what they can do for us to, to move them on in the divisions. We've got 200 plus professional athletes at Cage Warriors. We've become, over 20 years, we've become an institution of MMA. We've become the draft, you know? This is the draft of our sport. The NFL, they have a draft. You know, the NBA, they got the NCAA, that's the draft. This is the draft right here behind us, this cage. This cage is the draft of our sport. And over the next year, we'll have a draft of guys that will rise to the top of there, and they'll go on to be the biggest names in mixed martial arts. And I've no doubt we're gonna be seeing some of those guys here tonight. But look, a big roster means a big schedule, and we've got a huge month coming up in April, massive show in Manchester, and then of course, the longer way to return to Dublin. Tell us about what's coming up in April. Yeah, we've got Manchester April 15th, I believe, where we've got our lightweight champion, Hardwick, defending his belt. And then from there, so it's almost sold out. There's like 100 odd tickets left to that show. From there, we move on to the three arena in Dublin, where we see the unification fight between Reese McKee and Jimmy Wallhead, which I believe the entire industry is waiting to see that fight. So a huge fight to return to Dublin with. Yeah, I can't wait for that. I can't wait for Shelley versus Harilla as well. So much good stuff coming up on that card. But Graham, we've got so much good stuff coming up here tonight as well. And the man joining me to talk about it is none other than Mr. Daniel Strauss. Thank you very much, Brad. Our uh, headline for our first show this evening is Prince McLean taking on Matty Byfield. Matty, of course, training out a Team Renegade. These guys have a huge amount of momentum at the moment, obviously with Leon Edwards uh, retaining his UFC World's Weight title last weekend. Uh, but he's going, going up against uh, Prince today, the American, probably the most experienced guy that he's gone against so far. So really, really looking forward to that main event. Main event, Dan. Uh, a great co main event as well in the middleweight division. Gilham Kadena taking on the former middleweight champion, Matt Bonner. Those two guys had a little bit to say to each other at our weigh-ins yesterday. Cannot wait to see them settle that beat. We've got Sean De Silva, the highlight reel knockout artist, taking on Kiru Singh Sohota, making his Cage Warriors debut here tonight. Flyweight action, Ryan Hewitt, a training partner of former Cage Warriors flyweight champion, Jake Hadley. He's making his Cage Warriors debut against Ander Sanchez, who we've seen a couple of times before. Really, really exciting fight in the flyweight division. But it all starts with the mighty mole, Sam Kelly, taking on the debuting Pav Zahota. A fixture on the UK circuit, Pav Zahota finally makes his Cage Warriors debut tonight. He'll face fellow prospect Sam Kelly, who'll be looking to repeat his stunning debut performance. Ladies and gentlemen, we are live on UFC Fight Pass from the BT Sports Studios in London, England for Cage Warriors. Unplugged, your first fighter. Make the move to the cage in the blue corner. Please welcome Pav Sahota. <laughs> Oh. 
years of age. David all the way back in July of 2014. So this is the guy who's been around the block. He's been training and fighting. And as we said, a long career on the UK regional scene and a big step up here. Now, interesting as well, we're also going to see his brother, Kiru Singh Sahota, uh, competing later on in just a couple of bouts time. But Pat Sahota entering the Cage Warriors cage for the first time now. And we just await the arrival of his opponent, Sam Kelly. Ladies and gentlemen, making the walk to the cage in the red corner, please welcome Sam Almighty Mark Kelly! Just letting this one breathe a little bit, folks, because Sam Kelly has, uh, how can I put this, a rather bugly magnificent contingent of fans here in the BT Sport studio. They've been in here about an hour already, and they have not stopped chanting for their boy, the Mighty Mole. Second appearance here on Cage Warriors for the man representing Rio Grappling Club Manchester, and of course, SPG Rochdale as well. You see Cage Warriors veteran Martin Stapleton and my good friend Jamie Hay in the corner with him tonight. And a really, really impressive Cage Warriors debut at last November down against Jack Eglin. That crazy man to guillotine and choke and clean out. And we saw Eglin fight just a week ago and put on an absolutely phenomenal performance, which really makes Sam Kelly's victory stand out all that more. Hasn't been fighting quite as long as Sohota. He, he debuted in November of 2017 and per, turned pro in May of 2021. And of course, we last saw him on his Cage Warriors debut, Cage Warriors 146. That was in Manchester of November last year. Took a big step up in competition against Eglin, passed the test, and he's got another one here in the form of Pab Sohota. Let's take a look at the tail of the tape then for our opening contest. Both these young men, 4-1, 28 years old is Kelly Sahota, just one year older at 29. He's going to have a couple of inches in height is Sahota, 5'11", to Kelly's 5'8". Both men making weight comfortably yesterday. So for the first time this evening, let's throw it to our man in the cage, Mr. Hal Chaplin, to get this one underway. Ladies and gentlemen, this contest takes place in the Cage Warriors Bantamweight Division and is brought to you by Apex Fightway. Interesting first. Fighting out of the blue corner. He stands by Bill Lennon's tour. All official weight, 136 pounds even. He is fighting out of Huddersfield in England and brings with him to the cage a professional record of four wins with one defeat. Introducing Pow Sahota. Standing opposite him in the cage, fighting out of the red corner. He stands five feet eight inches tall. All official weight, 134.9 pounds. He is fighting out of Manchester in England. And brings with him to the cage a professional record of four wins with one defeat. Introducing Sam, the mighty Mark Kelly. Your referee in charge of the action begins, Mr. Daniel Moverheady. One of the best in the business, Mr. Dan Moverheady, the gentleman about to get this one underway. Three five-minute rounds if they need them in the Cage Warriors Judge. bantamweight division. Pab Sahota in one. the ready, solid black. Half up. He's taking on Sam Kelly in the black with red trim. Oh, it's a huge oh, knockdown oh, right. early. Kelly That's looking to finish this fight. Oh, he's hot. It's it's hot. It's hot. in record time. What a performance from the mighty ball. Oh my goodness. I just think his fans are vocal before. 
Wow. I mean, I don't know what I was expecting from that fight. I, I had so much to say about it because I've been commentating on the, the northern regional scene for so many years, and I've seen the rise of both these two guys. I've followed their careers uh, since the beginning. Did not know what to expect from this fight going in. I don't think I expected that, though, Dan. Look at this finish. A nice left hook early, oh. but it's the right cross on the button. And this was a great stoppage as well. Two or three times where, I mean, that, that ground and pound landed super clean. And what a start to his Cage Warriors career for the Mighty Mole. Left hand, right hand behind it. And the ground and pound just relentless and on point. And you're going to feel perhaps a host, for perhaps a host of that did not get a chance to uh, really get into this fight and show off his skills. I'm sure we'll see him back, but my goodness, what a win for Sam Kelly. 2-0 on Cage Warriors with two highlight reel emphatic finishes. One last look at this in super slow-mo. And as you say, Dan, a really good stoppage there from Dan Movahedi. At this point, you can safely say the fight is not defending, and instantly Movahedi's in there to stop the fight. Phenomenal stuff. Martin Stapleton and Jamie Hay in the corner there. Very happy with their man's performance. Are you entertained, people? Are you entertained? Good way to start the show, eh? It is. This is what happened last time, right? We had two crazy quick knockouts. A very happy Sam Kelly in the cage. Here's our man, Mr. Hal Chaplin, to make it official. Ladies and gentlemen, your referee, Mr. Daniel Motherhead, he calls a stop to this contest after just 11 seconds of the very first round, declaring your winner by way of TKO in the red corner, Sam. Yeah! 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 Well, Sam Kelly with an absolutely phenomenal performance here to start our show. What a knockout, just seconds in. I mean, I, don't, I didn't even get an official time on that, but it can't have been more than 30 oh. seconds, maybe. Oh, no, I would say even less than that. I'd say less than 20 seconds, closer to 15. I mean, it was literally the opening exchange yeah. of the fight. And look, sometimes that that happens in MMA. You know, you, you don't get started, but I mean, what, what a finish from Sam Kelly. I mean, just clean, precision handiwork. Yeah, 100%. And you do have to feel a little bit bad for his opponent, but like you said, that, that this is uh, one of those sports where those sort of things can happen, where you can do all the training and you can just get caught very early and, uh, and, and that's it, game over. Absolutely, and look, you know, as I said, I've been a big fan of Pat Sahota for many years, followed his career uh, across the regional scene as an amateur, and his brother also, uh, his brother has 20 amateur fights, I believe he's somewhere in the region of 15, these are kids who've been around the circuit for a long time, and I know he's got a lot more to offer than that, so hopefully we'll, we will see him back in the yellow gloves again, I'm sure he'll be able to pick himself up, dust himself off, and learn from this. But let's have a look at some replays now, because uh, this is Sam Kelly's moment, right? And we're going to give him his flowers here. Hey, we're going to watch the whole fight. So let's start that stopwatch down. <laughs> Both guys find their range early, but it was that clattering right hand from Sam Kelly. Uh, and it really was academic at that point. And, and you see Sahota getting back to his feet there. I mean, I'm counting about 12, 13, maybe 14 seconds. I'm saying sub-15 seconds, just uh, an, an insanely quick and incredibly clean performance. Uh, and a fantastic shot there uh, from the crowd. Sam Kelly's fans, as we said, Dan, they've been making some considerable noise ever since they were led into the venue earlier. Uh, I do believe they've been enjoying frosty beverages <laughs> from around 10 a.m. this morning, so I'm told by Sam. So in great spirits, I'm sure, and certainly making the noise in here tonight. Yeah, I'm not sure they could be rewarded any more uh, than a performance like that. And a really great stoppage. Dan Moverheady with the great stoppage there. And Sam Kelly celebrating atop the cage. 
I mean, what a moment. What well, a start to his Cage Warriors career, Dan. Uh, that highlight reel submission against Jack Eglin. Now he's got a highlight reel knockout as well. I mean, is there anything this kid can't do? Like, I can't wait to see his next performance. Well, more importantly, let's get him back in in a couple of weeks' time, right? I mean, no damage taken. Uh, this guy's ready to fight as soon as possible. Look, I mean, it's a distinct possibility, right? We're in Manchester, uh, April 15th, Saturday. As Graham Boyle said at the top of the broadcast, tickets uh, are selling out very, very quickly. Not many left at all. So if you want to get to that show, get on cagewarriors.com now and, and get involved. Of course, everyone else around the world will be able to catch on UFC Fight Pass. And who knows, maybe the Mighty Mole makes an appearance. But look, we're going to take a look now at what's coming your way on UFC 287, a huge pay-per-view offering coming up shortly. Israel Adesanya, he has never been beaten at 185 pounds. But Alex Pajeda is the boogeyman to Israel Adesanya. Oh my goodness! Pereira landed some really good shots. Nice left oh. hands from the challenger. Oh, he hurt him! He hurt him bad! That's the buzzer! The champ's starting to open oh. up now. It seems like we're looking at about 3 1 pretty comfortably for the champion. Adesanya five minutes away from remaining the UFC standard at 185 pounds. But the danger is still there with Fajita. Oh, he hurt him. He hurt him bad. Adesanya's on Oh, my God. There goes the champion. Oh, that's it. That's it. For him. He knocked me out, but this is my story, and it's about revenge. To be great, you gotta stand up when you fall. This is time for war. A fantastic night of mixed martial arts, Miami. Adesanya! This is an opportunity for him to get revenge and to show how great he truly is. But the Lux Mahita is a killer. They better come for me if you seem to me. I'll bring you back. Put their hands on like you're the stack. Ever been. Gilbert Garino burns! He's a real threat wherever he goes. He's going to be a lord. Crazy night. I cannot wait. Yeah. Victory is mine. Uh. Wow, Pereira versus Adesanya. Their first fight, absolutely phenomenal. I cannot wait for their second fight, Saturday, April 8th. Cannot wait for that one. Two middleweight bangers. But speaking of middleweight bangers, we got our own middleweight banger tonight, Dan. The former champ, Matt the Beast Bonner and Guillaume Cadena. They got into it a little bit yesterday at the weigh-ins. Very much looking forward to seeing these two guys squash that beef here tonight. Yeah, so as, as we were saying, Dan, uh, Matt Bonner and Cadena yesterday at the weigh-ins, Things got a little bit heated between those two middleweights. Tempers flared a little bit. I think we're going to be able to take a look now at exactly what went down. Oh, this is the guys backstage. This is the guys backstage now warming up. And I believe they've been put in changing rooms very, very far away from each other. Opposite ends of the venue, as we said, got a little bit tetchy uh, just about 24 hours ago at the weigh-ins. And look, a guy like Kadena uh, seeking his 26th professional submission victory here tonight. That guy knows how to tap you out. But let's take a look if we can, uh, if we can at what happened at the weigh-ins as we see a very stoic Matt Bonner there and uh, we all, you can see you can see for yourselves exactly the kind of situation that went down <laughs> and Matt Bonner is looking focused I, I mean, he's normally like the nicest guy in the world and I walked past him in the corridor before super super focused eyes down I'm looking forward to seeing a focus, Matt Bonner. You know, this is a guy who is undefeated in bouts, contracted above 175, 170 pounds. He's never been stopped as a professional in over 20 bouts. He's only been stopped once as an amateur, and that was in, I believe, his second amateur contest. This is a guy who is impossible to get out of there, it seems. Cadena, though, with 25 submission victories on his ledger, maybe he's the guy to do it. I mean, I'm looking forward to it. We've seen so much from Matt Bonner. I mean, we saw him 
uh, to you know his run through the last couple of years. Uh, he is one of the toughest guys that you can have, one of the toughest guys on the roster. But yeah, he's up against a, an interesting, different challenge than we usually see him against. Yeah, as you were saying that, we've seen a lot of Matt Bonner over the recent years. For my money, one of the biggest success stories in Cage Warriors over the uh, the pandemic era, yeah. I guess you'd call it, those uh, those lockdown shows without an audience, uh, went on that incredible run through the middleweight division, beating a legend like Matt Inman, beating George Smith, and then who can forget that fight against the Tyus Frederick? I mean, oh, that was that was absolutely insane. Uh, what are your memories of that fight? Yeah, completely mad. I mean. Natias Frederick just such a terrifying animal uh, in that division. And yeah, I mean, back and forth, I think it was fourth round, maybe even fifth round, rear naked choke finish, just out of nowhere. I mean, Matt Bonner, Bonner can do it all, and just incredibly tough the entire time. A bit of a Terminator-like character. Absolutely. Very excited to see how those two guys fare when they go against each other late tonight. But as we've talked about already, we've got stuff coming up in Manchester next month, April 15th. Let's take a look at Cage Warriors 152. Yeah, loads of great stuff coming up in Manchester. Uh, George Hardwick makes his return uh, against uh, Jan Leassi, uh, defending that lightweight title. And, uh, well, we saw George defending the title against Chris Bungard at Unplugged last November in this very venue. Uh, he's just become an absolute problem. He's terrorizing guys uh, with these body shots. What a champion George Hardwick's been for us on Cage Warriors over the past year or so. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh in his title fight, just, uh, I mean, a fantastic fight. Again, it's always with the body shots, uh, a super durable guy, a really funny, entertaining guy as well. Yeah, he's a fantastic champion. Absolutely. Uh, Brother Harry as well has been on an absolute tear uh, through the Cage Warriors featherweight division. Was supposed to compete actually in London last week, uh, unfortunately uh, was injured. Best wishes to Harry. Obviously, we want to see you back in the cage as soon as possible because you've got to think maybe one more performance, uh, maybe even not one more performance. Maybe, maybe there's a title opportunity for Harry Hardwick uh, coming in the very near future. Harry Hardwick fought Steve, Steve Amable last time out. Uh, and of course, we're going to see Steve Amable on our second show here tonight. And Dan, this is a guy who's been around the circuit for such a long, long time. Uh, a guy who's really been through the ringer. He's one of the most experienced guys on the Cage Warriors roster. I believe he debuted back in 2009. So this, this is a guy who's been fighting for a long, long time. He's actually welcoming a Cage Warriors debut on, uh, tonight. So talk about kind of the, the difference in, uh, in viewpoint these guys are going to have. Uh, Albert Diaz is going to be walking into this venue for the very first time. Steve Amable for about the millionth time. Yeah, and it, it does make a big difference when you have someone coming in and they haven't competed in an organization before. And when you're going in against someone who's so experienced, I think when you're that super experienced guy, you want to say, welcome, but I'm going to show you that this is my house. You know, you're going to try and give a pretty cold welcome to anyone coming in, letting them know who's boss. And at the same time, you know, Diaz is coming in to really try and uh, prove that, you know, I'm, I'm uh, maybe a change of the guard here. I'm here. I'm here to stay. And I'm going to put on a big performance against Steve Amable. Well, all that is coming up our second show live at 9 p.m. UK time. But what we've got coming up now is a phenomenal flyaway foul uh, between Ander Sanchez and Ryan Hewitt. Next up in the flyweight division, two fight Cage Warriors veteran Ander Sanchez returns to welcome Ryan Hewitt, a training partner of former champ Jake Hadley. Ladies and gentlemen, your next fighter making the walk to the cage in the blue corner. Please welcome Ander Sanchez. Ander Sanchez making his walk to the Cage Warriors cage for the third time as a professional. 
He's one and one in the famous yellow gloves. Made his MMA debut back in June of 2016 as an amateur. Went on a phenomenal line of one brand as an amateur. Actually reeled off nine straight, lost his final amateur bout, and made the leap to the pro ranks. That was in April of 2022. That was the first time we saw him on Cage Warriors. Had uh, a phenomenal pro debut with us. Uh, defeated Connor Wilson uh, very early, 30 seconds of round one, with uh, an absolute corker of a shot. And then took Lona Kavanagh the, dif uh, the distance. And when you're talking about a guy going the distance with Lona Kavanagh, that's pretty exceptional in and of itself, because Lona Kavanagh just looks to be the next big thing in this sport. Competed at the 2018 IMAP, so has competed at that international level as an amateur as well. And he does compete in a variety of other combat sports as well. This is not a guy uh, who just sticks to MMA. And as you can see in the briefly envision there, it's a man who loves Cage Warriors because he's got the Cage Warriors logo tattooed on his arm. Does that mean he gets free entry for life? I hope, yeah, maybe it does, maybe it does. I'll, have to, I'll, I'll speak to the marketing guys and see if we can make that happen. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, making the walk to the cage in the red corner, please welcome Ryan Hewitt. And a lot of support for Ryan Hewitt in the building as well. I'm not sure if Jake Adley is here. I believe he was initially intending to come. I can't see him from where uh, we're sat here in the commentary position, but I'm sure if he's not here, he will be watching uh, his training partner, Ryan Hewitt, making his Cage Warriors debut here tonight. I, I believe it was actually Jake Hadley that, that recommended Ryan Hewitt as a sign to Cage Warriors matchmaker, Ian Dean. Interesting amateur career. You know, he didn't have the best start. Uh, went two and seven as an amateur, but things seemed to start to come together for him at the end of that amateur run. Made his pro debut uh, in October of 2021 and did so uh, with a nice uh, KO finish in that only uh, pro bout. He struggled to get fights as a professional. He's uh, had three straight bouts fall through and uh, four in total since turning pro uh, just in October 2021, as we said. Let's make no mistake about it, he's taking a big step up in competition here tonight. But look, when you're training with a guy like Jake Hadley and the rest of the guys in that crew, you know what you're going to be getting yourself into in a Cage Warriors fight. I was watching his pro debut actually this morning and we've got to watch out for that left kick to the body and we've got to watch out for the body shots and, and speaking of body shots, Jake Hadley with that phenomenal body shot KO uh, last weekend. What me a tiny sum, Jake, so thanks if you're listening, but let's keep an eye out for that uh, from Ryan Hewitt here tonight at Cage Warriors. Let's take a look then at the title of the tape for this flyweight contest. 1-0, plays 1-1, one one, the record. Slightly older at 30 to 27 and slightly taller at 5'7 and a half. And the Sanchez standing uh, just five feet four inches tall. We'll see if that plays a factor. Both men around the 125 mark. All that remains is for our man in the cage, Mr. Hal Chaplin, to get this one underway. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this contest takes place in the Cage Warriors Flyweight Division. And is brought to you by Apex Fightwear. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner. He stands five feet four inches tall. Official weight, 125 points. Two pounds. He's fighting out of Harold Alioja in Spain and brings into the cage a professional record of one win with one defeat. Introducing Ando Sanchez. <laughs> Standing opposite him in the cage, fighting out of the right corner. He stands five feet seven and a half inches tall. Official weight, 125 pounds even. He is fighting out of Birmingham in England. Dan brings into the cage a professional record of one win. Introducing Ryan Hewitt. Your referee in charge when the action begins, Mr. Leon Roberts. Referee Leon Roberts, one of whoa, whoa, whoa. the most senior veteran referees on the circuit. About to get this one underway. Three five-minute rounds 
if they need them in the Cage Warriors flyweight division. Ryan okay, Hewitt in the light round, blue, and the Sanchez ready? in the Just black. Well, let's see if Sanchez comes out looking for another quick finish. Well, we know he's got the hands. He also competes in BJJ tournaments. He competes in combat sambo, kickboxing. The real jack of all trades is Ander Sanchez. Well, we're past the 30 second mark, Dan, so we're already running longer than the previous edition of Unplugged. Nice counter left hand there, but Hewitt caught it on the guard. Let's see if Hewitt can take advantage of that little bit of height and reach he's got on Ander Sanchez. Sanchez is going to have to find a way in, find an angle or get behind that jab. There we go, multiple shots into the takedown attempt. Yeah, not a bad position here for Sanchez. I mean, look at the power, that, that short frame, but a beautiful use of that whizzer with the left arm of Hewitt there is able to stuff that takedown quite nicely. You know, when, when you're so compact and, 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 and so much more stocky, you do have the ability to get underneath the opponents and pick them up a lot easier. You know, you can see how muscle-bound uh, Sanchez is, so expect to see, especially in this first round, many mat returns going to be picking up uh, off of these single or double leg positions. So far, uh, he was doing a pretty good job of defending this takedown, throwing some elbows. Yeah, nice elbows from Hewitt there. Attempting to get back to his feet there, and he does it successfully, but Sanchez just on him and some nice strikes from this underhook position here. Still jockeying for position up against the side of the cage there. Different approach from Ander Sanchez than we saw in that first fight against Wilson while it lasted. A little attempt to throw there from uh, Hewitt, almost executed, but Sanchez just uh, a little bit too strong in his base. It looked like he managed to connect those hands in the body lock. Uh, he's given up that position now, but Hewitt using that wizard on the left-hand side really effectively. To separate, Hewitt tries that front kick. Sanchez trying to get on the hips there. Very oh, nice. nice. Yeah, very nicely defended yet again. And Hewitt looking a little bit more energized than Sanchez after that wrestling exchange. Yeah, he certainly looks like being able to defend oh. that take, give him a bit of confidence and a snapping right hand there. Switches to southpaw, fires the kick up. Yeah, Sanchez looking a little bit slower than he was uh, in the opening couple of minutes after that. I mean, it was quite a, a, a high output uh, wrestling exchange there, even though not much happened. Kick, the right hand comes back from Sanchez. And again, stuffed quite easily by Hewitt. Yeah, it seems like Hewitt's really got the timing of Sanchez down on those entries. Yeah, he's looking more comfortable. He's looking for the right hook there. Didn't catch all of it. Fires the head kick in the corner of Ryan Hewitt. Just advising the man not to get complacent here. They obviously think he's oh. on the front foot in this one. He's got to be careful. We know Sanchez can hit hard. Yeah. Hewitt's starting to put the pressure on now. Teases the uppercut there, does Hewitt. Trying to get a bite. There's the kick to the body. And he's called his man again. Yeah, Sanchez is running in there for a takedown, but not, nothing in terms of a setup here. There it is again, but very nicely stuffed by Hewitt. Beautiful takedown defense we've seen from Hewitt so far in this fight. Sanchez is in a, a, not a bad position here, similar to what we saw in the first couple of minutes in that first uh, clinch exchange. Hewitt with the wizard on his left, uh, left hand side. 
Probably not going to have a lot of time to do anything with it here. But again, puts that kick into the body. And he looked like he hurt Andrew Sanchez a couple of times with that left body kick towards the end of the round. Yeah, Sanchez looking pretty strong for the first half of that round, but after we saw that first break off of the clinch, it really looked like um, it really looked like uh, Ryan Hewitt had found his range. His, his timing on the takedown defenses was really, really clean, and he just looked a lot more comfortable. Definitely looking dominant in the second half of that round. This the second round's gonna be really interesting. Yeah, caught that high kick on the hands. There was the kick to the body, though. Yeah, you caught those body kicks really nicely before the fight. Nice stepping elbow there from Brian Hewitt. Didn't catch that one on the first time of looking. And again, that body kick. And you instantly see Sanchez just clinch up a little bit there, bringing those elbows in nice and low after that body kick. Trouble him a little bit. Yeah, and you've got to wonder if uh, Hewitt is throwing those uppercuts when uh, Sanchez is rushing in on some of these takedown attempts out of desperation, he might get caught. Second round, you ready? You ready? Let's go. Second of three here at the BT Sports Studio. Hewitt looking very calm here to start the second round. Oh, it's nice left there by Ander Sanchez, though. Don't forget to join in the conversation tonight on social media. Use the hashtag CW151. Anders looking uh, strong as he enters the clinch here, but instead looks to strike from it. Maybe a little bit of a second win for Sanchez. Just caught that head kick on the gloves there, did Sanchez. Hewitt looking very confident with his range here in the second round. And again, goes down to the body. Of course, the danger is once you've got him biting on the body kick, then you go back high. And that could be a problem for Ander Sanchez if he doesn't figure this out. Kicking away at the lead leg now. It's Sanchez. Yeah, we saw Sanchez utilizing this in the first half of that first round. He looked to be having a little bit of success with it, so not a bad strategy to, to, to start going back there. Great footwork there from Pewitt to slide out of the way. Dole takes a couple of shots there. There's the level change. Does it get it? Yeah. Nice knee to the body from Ander Sanchez, though. Yeah, Sanchez still aggressively looking for the takedown, and so far, I mean, flawless uh, takedown defense from Ryan Hewitt so far in this fight. Hewitt switching stance here, keeping Sanchez guessing, tries the spinning back fist, doesn't land. I mean, I feel like the most success we've seen from Sanchez is really when he mixes the striking with the clinching. I think trying to close the distance a little bit, maybe get his man up against the fence, look, the clinch and strike from there is going to be, you know, he's not had any success in the takedown attempts. I think maybe a combination of that clinch work and the, you know, utilizing those shorter limbs to strike from the clinch. He yeah, has had some success there again. Goes for the body lock, puts Hewitt on the fence. Yeah, so this is the sort of position I'm talking about. You know, we saw him have some real success with those short hooks from this sort of position, utilizing an underhook with the right hand and then firing off some shots uh, with the knees or with that left hand. See some wrist control here as he tries to change the level to a single leg. Here we might see a high crutch position. He might try and lift him off of the ground. There we go. Yep, here it is. And finally able to hit a takedown. Many, many attempts in this fight. And with two minutes left on the clock in the second round, we finally see Ander Sanchez able to get his first clean takedown. It certainly is clean. Butterfly guard underneath for Ryan Hewitt. And again, using those short limbs, elbows, and big punches from this position come very nicely. And Hewitt trying to get his back up against the fence. You know, we saw how effective he was at using the fence to stay on his feet. 
So you'd, you'd uh, expect him to be able to use the fence in a similar way to get back to his feet. But great work taking out that that right hand was basing and Sanchez just removed it straight away. I mean, a minute 20 to work from here. It's not a huge amount of time, but it's enough time to do something. We can see now from this half guard position, either you stand, you strike from here, or you look to pass. He looks like he's going to try and pass to the mount. He's taking the back position from here. He's got to be careful. He wants to get that second hook in. He needs to be careful about losing the position, really intelligent to release that back position in the side control here. A minute to work. And we, Sanchez has had such a struggle so far getting this fight to the ground. He really wants to try and utilize this as best he can, either get into a stronger position to strike from, either going back to a, uh, a half guard position or taking the mount position to strike. But 45 seconds left. I mean, we're not just looking at the domination in terms of the grappling. We're, we're looking at what damage can be done from here. So far, not a huge amount, but this half guard position, a fantastic position to strike from. Again, a, 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 not a super clean attempt to take the mount there, and he sits back for a leg lock. This would not be what I would look to go to, but if he can get a bite on this angle, the defense is going to be didn't come particularly effectively from Hewitt. And there you go, submission right at the end of that second round, out of nowhere. You know, maybe Anders Sanchez was just in the position where he thought, look, I, 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 I'm losing this, this fight. I'm a round down in the first, possibly a round down in the second. It's time to take a risk. He did it and it paid off. I mean, there you go. That's a sand in jiu-jitsu effort. Go for a leg lock. <laughs> and in this case, that's exactly what Anders Sanchez did. And, you know, I thought maybe not, not the smartest move. It looked like perhaps he was changing the momentum of the fight. If he was able to continue in the second round and get another big takedown, he was looking very dominant in that top position. But he was able to pick up the hill, and the defense of Hewitt simply wasn't there. Uh, a pretty fast tap, but obviously the fight was very clean. Yeah, high amplitude Here you see. take down there and, and talk us through it, Dan. Yeah, it's an outside heel hook, what, what Hewitt should have been doing. And he, and he tried to do it, which is to pass his leg over. And actually, you saw from there the reaction from Sanchez as that second leg. What's the right leg of Sanchez throw over? Uh, Hewitt did the correct thing to try and pass here, but he didn't want that second leg coming over. And what that does, it stops the hip from being able to alleviate the pressure. Uh, obviously, you know, the, 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 the foot not extended in the right position, you've got to be kicking that leg through, try, trying to hide that heel and take pressure off the leg. I mean, just really, really nice work from Ander Sanchez. Uh, and heel hooks, obviously, one of the more, uh, I mean, all submissions are dangerous, obviously, but in terms of injuries, yeah. a, a very short amount of time from being quite painful to being quite a serious knee injury, right? So yeah, absolutely. certainly no shame in tapping to a heel hook like that. Look, if a heel hook's on, a heel hook's on, and it was, so, you know, I, I would have imagined that Ryan Hume wouldn't have tapped if it wasn't. So there's nothing to suggest that that wasn't a, a really, really nice heel hook. But yeah, you're absolutely right. There's less sensitivity when you're going for shoulders, elbows, stuff like that. There's more sensitivity with the upper body when you're attacking someone's leg. A lot of the time it feels like it's barely on and then boom, your leg's gone. Well, you see the tattoo on Anders Sanchez's chest. It says uh, discipline and consistency, and he certainly was able to stay disciplined in uh, the midst of heavy fire there from Ryan Hewitt early on. Down on the scorecards, almost certainly as we approach the end of that second round, would have had a heck of a job in the third. Got it done in the last 30 seconds of the second round. Celebrating in the cage now. So let's throw it to Mr. Hal Chaplin to make this one official. Well, ladies and gentlemen, your referee, Mr. Leon Roberts, calls a stop at this contest after four minutes and 36 seconds of round number two, declaring your winner by way of heel hook in the blue corner, Ander uh, Sanchez! Well, what a start to unplug down. We've seen a, a crazy KO and a pretty crazy submission, too. Right? We don't see the heel hooks all that often no. here on Cage Warriors. I don't think I've ever seen a heel hook whilst commentating for Cage Warriors. It is, it's just something that you don't see people go for very often unless they're a specialist. Um, and you don't see people get very often when, you, when they do. So, I mean, fantastic work. But what an interesting fight because uh, Sanchez was really 
He was trying to get the fight to the ground the entire time, and he was struggling. The, the takedown defensive hero was really, really good, and finally, he was able to use that short, compact, powerful physique to, to get a, a big pickup off the ground uh, to, to stop his opponent from having any sort of balance and base. He got to top position. He was looking very comfortable. You could see as soon as it hit the ground, you could see why he was trying to get the fight to the ground the entire time. And then, yeah, you know, looking like he was going to run out of time to work and at the end of that round, he sits back for the hill hook and he gets a quick tap. And, and Andrew Sanchez there just exiting the arena and uh, uh, he was trying to hug anyone <laughs> in the vicinity. I'm surprised we didn't get one here ourselves. I'm sure we might do afterwards uh, <laughs> if we go backstage. But yeah, what, what a performance. Uh, and, you know, to not, not only get a cool submission like that, but to do it after being on the back foot. Uh, and, and we thought in that first round, he looked to be hurt by the body kick. So for him to, to not just have the... Uh, the physical toughness, but the mental toughness to, to fight through that and get that submission speaks volumes for this young man. And, and maybe the fact that we're not necessarily looking at a guy who's one and one, we're looking at a guy with, uh, I, I believe, actually, I said nine and one on his way out, I believe it's actually uh, closer to 15 amateur fights. Wow. So he does have a bit of experience, not necessarily all at the highest level, but did compete in the IMAFs uh, and, and has had all his pro fights and cage warriors, which obviously are a high level, went the distance with Lona Kavanagh, and not many people are going to be saying that over the next few years, believe me. But look, we have more stuff to come here tonight. We've already mentioned our big show in Manchester in just a few weeks' time. We've got a huge return to Ireland. It's Cage Warriors 153. It's the unification bout between Reese McKee and Jimmy Wallhead, and it's going to be epic. Let's take a look at what's coming up in Dublin. Well, Reese McKee versus Jimmy Wallhead. I mean, Dan, I don't think I've been looking forward to a fight more over the last few years at Cage Warriors than that. It's going to be absolutely insane. You're joining me in Ireland. I am. Finally, you're going to be <laughs> at one of the epic ones, right? Yeah, and I, I can stop drops. making that mistake every couple of shows where I say, wasn't that fight great? And you say, no, I wasn't that. <laughs> we, We're going to have a good time in Dublin now, my friend. Yeah, it's going to be my first time going over to Ireland for a Cage Warriors. Really, really looking forward to it. And yeah, I mean, what a, what a massive fight we have. I mean, watching uh, Jimmy Wallhead's return to Cage Warriors and the run that he's had, the performance he's been putting in, everyone I've spoken to from his team is saying that he's in fast, fantastic shape. Uh, you know, getting better, the skills are increasing all the time. Uh, this is going to make for a fantastic match, I think. You know, Jimmy Wallhead's a guy who's been around since the beginning of Cage Warriors, quite literally. Uh, it's just a pleasure and a privilege and an honor to see him fight and to see him return to Cage Warriors at this stage in his career and put on some of the best performances that we've ever seen. And all of a sudden, he's in title contention. All of a sudden, he's the interim champ. All of a sudden, he's one fight away from becoming the undisputed champ. And who knows what goes on from there. You know, every time we see Jim fight now, you're going to make the most of it because we don't know how many more times we're going to see him don those yellow gloves. So to see him finally with that gold belt around his waist was absolutely fantastic. But... The guy standing between him and that unified title uh, is certainly not going to be a walk in the park. Reese McKee, you know, got to the UFC perhaps a little bit too early in his career. Fought two absolute killers in Alex Morono and Hamzat Chimaev. You know, no shame in those losses. I was surprised to see the UFC let him go. I thought he'd be given an op another opportunity, but he came back here to Cage Warriors. And during his time back in Cage Warriors, he's put on two absolute barnstormers uh we saw him against manta kiwi putting on an absolute clinic and then the fight of the year from 2022 against justin burleson uh, absolutely wild uh, dan i'm so excited about this uh, the entire card but this fight's just off the charts yeah absolutely i remember calling his first fight back in cage warriors and he just you could tell that this guy was on another level missed the big uh, uh that 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 huge uh fight that I just keep hearing about all the time um, last time I think it was in Belfast so really looking forward I think uh, one of the best matches you can make on Cage Warriors at the moment yeah absolutely and it is being made and it's going down April 29th but we have even more good stuff coming up 
we've got Cage Warriors 154. That's just a week later, May the 6th in Rome. Check it out. Well, Cage Warriors returns to Rome on my birthday, May the 6th. Happy birthday to me. <laughs> I cannot wait for this card. And I can't wait for the flyweight title fight. Dylan Hazan uh, taking on Kayla Lockwood. Of course, uh, Michele Marcioni won the Cage Warriors uh, bantamweight title last time out. He moved up from the flyweight division, took on Don Wooding uh, in a fight that kind of no one expected to see. Yeah. Dan, you did call that one. That was absolutely insane. I was watching that one from my couch at home, going wild, nearly flipping the coffee table. What an exciting fight that was. I mean, it really was insane. We've spoken about it so many times, but the atmosphere in that room, by the time we got to that final fight, I mean, the, in, in every single fight on that card, the Italian fighters had won, and the energy got higher and higher every single time. And then, you know, we, we, we expected Wooden maybe to, to come out with a quick finish. It looked like it was going to go that way a couple of times. But Martignoni, just like with this incredibly gutsy performance, just managed to grind his way out for the win. And you could feel the, 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 the momentum uh, shift in uh, the Italians' favor and the energy in the room as the final bell went for, uh, in those five rounds, it was completely insane. It was an insane fight. Yeah, it was insane to watch it on TV. And I mean, we're going to have another fantastic uh, title fight with another Italian guy fighting in the main event for the exact same belt. I'm sure we'll be talking about that uh, much more in the coming weeks. But look, Matty Byfield tonight, you want to talk about the guy uh, riding a wave of momentum in the back now on the left-hand side here, Matty Byfield, the member of Team Renegade, Leon Edwards, uh, of course, won the UFC, or defended rather, the UFC welterweight title last weekend. This guy's going to be riding a wave of momentum down. Well, I mean, it's hard to argue that Team Renegade isn't the hottest most exciting MMA gym I team in the country at the moment. Yeah, I mean, what a performance Leon put on, just showing everyone that it wasn't a fluke that first time around. Insane performance. You know, you see Tom Brees uh, in, in, in the background there with Matty. And uh, yeah, huge amount of momentum coming in for Matty. And, you know, what, what a performance we've seen him in his last couple of fights on Cage Warriors as well. Yeah, absolutely. Look, taking a step up in competition here yeah. tonight, though. Uh, Prince McLean, a veteran, started competing in 2006. So wow. this is a guy who has been around the block. He was on uh, The Ultimate Fighter, fought Mike Dolce on The Ultimate Fighter. This is how long this guy's been competing. And he's one of those guys. Win or lose, it never goes to the judges. It's, it's go hard or go home for Prince McLean. He's actually living in Finland now. He's an American born and bred, but living in Finland. And he says he's at the first time in his career that he truly feels like he's got everything in place to just be able to train and just be able to fight. So uh, in his mid to late 30s now, I believe he's 36 years old, he's looking at something of a career resurgence. And look, when you've got a guy who's been around that long, whether he's, he's got a few wins and a few losses here and there, this is a guy who knows every trick in the book and is surely going to be dangerous. A step up for Byfield, but exactly the kind of test he needs. Yeah, that's it, 100% it. That's exactly what I was just thinking. You know, th this is the step up in competition against the more experienced opponent that we need to see from Matty. Uh, you know, you don't want to, you see some guy come in, they get massive stoppages, submissions, TKOs, and you think just chuck him in the deep end. No, you want to be slowly building them up, and I think this is a fantastic fight for Matty Byfield, that step up in experience, that step up in competition. I think it's going to be a really interesting one to see exactly where Matty is. Absolutely, and look, speaking of interesting ones, speaking of ones that I'm looking forward to in particular, Kiru Singh Sahota is about to make his Cage Warriors debut against the show stealer, Sean Claudinho da Silva. That's coming up right now. In flyweight action, Kiru Singh Sahota follows in his brother's footsteps, making his Cage Warriors debut tonight. He'll face Brazilian-born German-based show stealer Sean De Silva. 
4-0. I'm unbeaten. Of course, it feels good to win, but I'm not going to the win. I always want to perform good, and that's my main focus. For a Spanish kid who came over, the other ones have been like beatdowns where I've slowly beaten the person into like a TKO, but this one was just like a savage one-punch knockout. He dropped to the floor, and I just, I just seen my opportunity and just took it. In my last fight, it was a good fight. I knocked my opponent down with a flying knee. It was a good feeling. My opponent didn't wake up, so I was a little bit worried about him, but he's now okay, and yeah. I've won my last four fights. I feel like I've got a lot of momentum coming into this fight, and I feel like big things are gonna happen after this fight. I'm fighting Sean De Silva tonight, and uh, from what I see, he likes to stand. He's a bit more of a striker, so I think it's gonna be a really uh, exciting matchup for the fans. Yes, my opponent is also a boxer. And he likes to strike, he likes to brawl also, and it's gonna be an amazing fight, so check it out. And we're gonna dance in the ring, we're gonna dance in the cage, and it's gonna be amazing. In this fight, you're just gonna see a, a good stand-up battle, but I can only see it ending in a knockout finish for myself. In my fights, everything is possible, so just be surprised and be patient, and something good will happen there, something amazing will happen there. Absolutely, 100%. As I was saying earlier, Dan, you know, I've, I've followed both the Soto Brothers' careers for uh, for some time now, and I've been privileged to see uh, many walkouts like this over the years. Kiru Singh Sahota, 9 and 1 as a professional, 12 and 8 as an amateur, so 20 amateur bouts uh, between his debut in November 2013 and when he turned pro in September 2018, making his Cage Warriors debut here tonight and currently riding a four fight winning streak. And as you heard him talk about in that pre fight BT, this is a guy who likes to stop people. He'll go out there and he'll fight for as long as he needs to, but if he can put you out of there for that one big shot, he will. And he carries that power very well at flyweight. He loves what he does. Sean Marcos Claudinho da Silva did ask to, uh, to be referred to by his full name during the walkouts at least. He's letting us get away with Sean da Silva for the rest of the fight now. Thank God for that. But look, the man representing Plan Pizza, mixed martial arts. Great, great name for a gym, by the way. Plan Pizza, mixed martial arts. Love it. 4 0 as a professional. Have an amateur bout, drop that. But as you can see, this guy's all about the entertainment. You know, he, he weighed in yesterday and, and turned around and, and said to everyone at the way, and like, this is going to be a fun one tomorrow night. Don't, don't, don't sleep on this one. This is going to be good fun. I mean, have you seen someone have so much fun on a walkout as this? Someone should remind him that he's about to go and uh, get locked in a cage with another man trying to knock him out. Well, speaking of knockouts, as we said, 4-0 as a professional, Sean De Silva. And if you put his name into Google, you're going to find his last fight pretty quickly because it was a highlight reel flying knee knockout. And he put his opponent stiff as a board on his back. As he said in the pre-fight BT there, you know, pretty scary moment as his opponent was down for some time. But thankfully, uh, you know, no permanent injury there. Everything was okay in the end. But 
shows you the kind of entertaining style uh, this guy brings. He's not content just to fight. He's not content just to win. He wants those big, flashy KOs. A and you can say the same thing about Kiri Singh Zahota. He wants those big finishes, and he's had his fair share over the years. Well, these two are finally in the cage, so let's have a look at the tail of the tape in this flyweight contest. 4-0 undefeated is Sean De Silva. 9-1 is Kiru Singh Sahota. Both men, 27 years of age. A pronounced height difference here. 5-6 plays 5-10. Both guys weighing in comfortably yesterday. So all that remains is for our man in the cage, Mr. Howell Chaplin. Let's get this one on the way. Ladies and gentlemen, this contest takes place in the Cage Warriors Flyweight Division and is brought to you by Apex Fightwear. Interesting first. Fighting out of the blue corner, he stands 5 feet 10 inches tall. Official weight, 125.8 pounds. He's fighting out of Huddersfield in England and brings with him to the cage a professional record of nine wins with one defeat. Introducing Kiru Singh Sahota. Standing opposite him in the cage, fighting out of the red corner. He stands five feet six inches tall. Official weight. 125.2 pounds. He is fighting on a fight again in Germany and brings into the cage a perfect professional record of four wins. Introducing to you, Sean Clementino da Silva. Your referee in charge when the action begins, Mr. Rich Mitchell. Referee Rich Mitchell about to get this one underway. Three five minute rounds if they need them in the Cage Warriors flyweight Ready. division. Ready! Kiru Singh Sahota in the orange. Sean De Silva in the dark grey. Oh, a nice Superman punch there from De Silva. Goes back to kicking the leg. Oh, wow. Three heavy leg kicks from De Silva there. Tries to leap in with that Superman punch. You have to be careful though against Sahota. You can't leave your hands down like that too often and get away with it. Nice overhand and uppercut. Tries the knee. Uppercut from the clinch there. Sahota wears it well though. Now, this super relaxed style, this open style like this, it's one of those things that just works perfectly until it doesn't. But so far, you know, it is working pretty well for the silver. Carrying that energy from that walkout, that dancing into the cage right now. Yeah, he certainly looked to be in an absolutely fantastic headspace uh, the entire time. He's been with us at the hotel or fight week at the weigh-ins yesterday. Oh, nice spinning back fist. I have a feeling someone's looking for another highlight reel knockout here. I yeah, certainly wouldn't disagree with that assessment, Dan. The silver dancing around the outside of Sohota here. Sohota doing a really good job of not getting drawn into the antics here. Looking very, very uh, focused still, sticking to the game plan. Well, we're talking about a guy with 30 fights, right, across amateur and pro. Yeah, but these sort of antics, they can get to you on a psychological level, you know, they can... It's almost disrespectful when someone's dancing in front of you like that, and sometimes the emotions can get to you. But yeah, when you are more experienced, you are uh, generally have better control over those those instinctive reactions and emotions. But, I mean, De Silva's mixing up that flamboyancy with really, really effective striking. He is absolutely chopping away at the legs of Sohota. And he's tried that flying knee a couple of times already. Of course, there's always the danger down that, as you say, he does get caught up in wanting that highlight reel finish, and he starts going to the one a little bit too often, trying to make lightning strike twice, if you like. What you don't want to be against the, a guy guy's experience to Sohota is predictable. I mean, so far, one thing I wouldn't call the silver is predictable. Yeah, maybe predictably <laughs> unpredictable is exactly. a better way of framing that. I'd say so. <laughs> 
heavy leg kick there from the Silva. So Hota not really been able to fire anything off with success so far in this fight. You've got to be wondering, maybe Sahota's thinking, maybe I just need to, to weather this early storm, this first round, wait for the guy to slow down a little bit, but... There's a fly, need a big combination, and Sahota's right here. Oh, he landed Silver looking for the finish. Oh, my word. What a chin on Sahota. And Silva's just, the Silva's just smiling at him. I mean, the Silva really is having the time of his life right now. I mean, he hasn't been touched. Half the stuff he's throwing is landing. It all looks good. He's so relaxed here. I mean, normally after a flurry like that, you'd, you'd be asking how much was taken out of the tank. But with these flyweights, we know they can go for five minutes, 15 minutes, 25 minutes, no problem. And the read on these shots from De Silva, I mean, the head movement is, is just impeccable so far. You hear Carl Prince in the corner there telling Sohota to keep him working. They, they're perhaps trying to run the batteries down a little bit. Nice leg kick from Sohota there. The silver fires back. Sohota to the body there from Sohota. The silver landing. Another couple of hooks. Tries not flying again. Just a little bit shy that time. That kick's landed a couple of times now for Sohota. Yeah, Sohota's starting to be his way in. Yeah, starting to have a little bit more success. He's found his range a little bit. You know, smart to start attacking those legs. I mean, Sohota's so so legs are so long. All of his limbs are... Oh, oh there we go! Sohota drops him! The silver swine, but he was hurt there. Stop there! And now it's interesting. Now we got to fight. But finally, the last 30, 45 seconds of that round. Sohota's finally found his range. The silver popping and locking on his way back to the corner. <laughs> this guy's an absolute madman. I love it. <laughs> that is it. I think you summed it up perfectly. A madman. I can almost guarantee you right now his corner's telling him, calm down, relax, keep it tight. But I have a feeling he's not going to listen. Let's take a look at the uh, replays here. And here's the spinning back oh, fist. And I that mean, was a beautiful cupping shot. Fantastically. Just pivots into this one wonderfully. So this is going to be very interesting in the second round now. Has Sahota found that range? Does he know what's working? Is he going to find that range again? And it was a double jab, right hand. And there was an element of the fact that, you know, De Silva was moving at an angle there, but Sean De Silva got put down at the end of that round. Now, not enough. Uh, for Sahota to win the round back, oh, definitely. but certainly enough to give him a lot of momentum going into this second, ready, knowing ready. he can hurt Sean De Silva if he gets him where he wants him. Can he do that again in the second round? We're about to find out. Yeah, I feel like Sahota was really, you know, perplexed by the puzzle that is De Silva, uh, finally starting to work out a little bit right at the end of that first round. And this is the difference here, because because the silver has to get very close to Sahota. He has to get on the inside. He has to use those short hooks and uppercuts, and then he can look to throw that flight knee. Sahota, if he can pin him down, can use that range, can use those long kicks and the long straight punches. Yeah, so far we're seeing that utilization of those uh, long legs and those that long jab. And the question mark kick there as well. Another nice up got from the silver. Keeping that head moving. Silver went over the top of the right hand there. Nice low kick again. And he's reddened up. And look at that reaction from Sohota. As soon as uh, the silver went to show that low kick again, the stance changed. He's having a lot of success with those with those uh, leg good, kicks. Good, good. Yeah. I think he maybe just caught the box there, and De Silva saying he's good to go. Both men landing now. They're yeah, looking a lot more competitive in the second round. Oh, beautiful! Oh, he looked like he hurt him, and it has hurt him. De Silva backing his man up. Look for the spinning back fist again. Didn't get it. 
I love it. The mind of someone who, when they have someone potentially hurt, will choose to go for a spinning back fist. Starting to unload now to Silva. Yeah. Uppercut through the middle. I mean, the chin of Sahota is, is incredibly yeah, tough. Back. Oh, he's caught down the left hook. Rich yeah, Mitchell right taking right a close back. look at this one. And it's over! From the walkout to the finish to the celebration at the end, there's what a some, performance. There's some guys you just see who you go, I want to see him fight again. I want to see him fight soon. I mean, the guy is just pure entertainment. You're, you're the, the, the total package. I mean, movement, style, he's having a good time. And that killer instinct, as soon as he has his man hurt, <laughs> able to put it away. And he's not done yet. It's all in the hips, as they say. <laughs> but it was all in the fist of Sean De Silva here tonight. Let's take a look at the finish here, Dan. And Sohota covering up here, uh, not really intelligently defending yeah, towards the end of these exchanges. And there's only so many times a referee's going to let you take big shots like that. Yeah, I good think that's standing a, stop there from Rich Mitchell. Yeah, I agree. I think that was a pretty good call. Rich uh, really gave him a, quite a few opportunities there, and he was eating a lot of these shots, you can see. I mean, he has a, an, an insane chin. We've seen him eat multiple shots in this fight that he didn't seem to be too phased by, but multiple big shots landed and seemed to be affecting uh, Sahota there, so I think a very good stoppage. Uh, and I, I think Sahota still actually seems to be a little bit stunned here. Yeah. He was actually walking back towards the referee with his with his hands up almost as if he was about to be put back into the fight. So his corner team and our medics are I mean, just going to be taking a look at him now. I'm sure he's going to be absolutely fine I mean, as we see the handiwork here of Sean De Silva. Yeah, I mean, if there's any doubt about the stoppage there, I mean, that would, would, would yeah, you're right, you're absolutely right. So Hoda just looks, still looks to be a little bit out of it and actually being walked out of the cage now. So that will put any doubt about that stoppage to rest for sure. Yeah, no, no. No doubt about that in my mind at all. Perfect stoppage from Rich Mitchell. But look at Sean De Silva here, having the absolute time of his life. And it's gone so like it. So does his corner team. I mean, I don't know where these guys are going afterwards, but I want an invite down. I don't know about you. You're getting the crowd going as well. That's what you like to see. I think the classes at that gym is uh, it's BJJ at 9, kickboxing at 11, and dance moves at 1, right? 100%. Well, let's throw it to our man in the cage, Mr. Hal Chaplin, to make it official. Ready? Ladies and gentlemen, your referee, Mr. Rich Mitchell, calls a stop to this contest after two minutes and six seconds of round number two, declaring your winner by way of knockout in the red corner, Sean Cardino Garcia. Well, sign me up. <laughs> for two tickets to the Sean De Silva show, ladies and gentlemen. Cage Warriors might just have a new superstar on its hands. And I don't want to do Ian Dean's job for him, but I'm just saying, Sean De Silva, Lana Cavanaugh, maybe some point later oh, this year. Wow. Could you what imagine that? that? What Could about you that? Imagine? Who's to say? Take Who's to guys. say? Maybe if we're, uh, if we're both very good, Santa might bring us that one for, uh, for Christmas this year. But what a debut, all jokes aside. This guy, all week, has been saying he's going to be the show stealer. He's going to be the show stopper. And that's exactly what we saw here tonight at Unplugged. What a performance from Sean De Silva as he exits the cage. <laughs> Trying to get a selfie with uh, young Dion, our media guy. I mean, this guy, this, this, this is just the million dollar man, right? For Cage Warriors, what yeah. a superstar. Yeah, just oozing energy there, good vibes all around. And Sean De Silva now just backstage here at the BT Sports Studio. I don't know where he's going, but wherever it is, that's where the party's at. <laughs> I mean, what, what, what can we say? What can we say about that? What a debut from Sean De Silva. I mean, just so much fun. When you have someone who's walking out like that, you, 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 you always worry a little bit, don't you? You go, 
you don't look like you're taking this seriously. And sometimes people get in there, they dance their way to the cage and they get knocked out in 20 seconds. Uh, and, and, and that's not what we saw. We saw someone who was having the time of his life on the walkout, in the cage, but mixing it up with some really, really nice striking, beautiful movement, head movement, timing, and killer instinct uh, to put on a fantastic performance. Got caught at the end of that first round. Uh, and it looked like it was going to be really interesting going into the second. Second was definitely more competitive than the first. Uh, but, but once he started to lay that pressure on and that damage, uh, got a very, very good stoppage there. Yeah, absolutely. And, and against the guy, as we said, in, in Kiryu Singh Sahota with, uh, with 30 fights across amateur and pro. And I, I'd probably say a couple more as well. I believe he's done a bit of kickboxing too. Uh, and then Sean De Silva coming in at, at 4-0, uh, looking like he could hang no problem. And well, let, let's take a look again at the finish, Dan. Just smelled blood here and was absolutely relentless. You see Rich Mitchell already taking a look, telling uh, Kiryu to defend himself. Yeah, these big looping shots were landing. I'd say three or four big shots that landed and hurt and hurt Sahota there. And uh, I mean, a fantastic uh, standing stoppage by the referee. Great shot selection as well, you know, mixing those uppercuts in with the hooks. Uh, he tried that flying knee a few times. I don't think he managed to land it super clean in this fight, but. It's certainly something to think about, especially if you've got any consideration of maybe trying to shoot him and take the guy down to stop him hitting you. Uh, so many weapons in the toolkit from Sean De Silva. And wow, you know, th there's a lot going on in the Cage Warriors flyweight division at the moment. Um, I cannot wait to see this guy back in there. I, I mean, what, what a showman. You know, we talk about this being like the fight business, and it is a business, and part of that is being entertaining. And I think everybody who leaves here tonight, whatever happens for the rest of the evening, and we've already had some wild finishes before that, everyone's going to remember Sean De Silva, right? Yeah, you're 100% right. I think a lot of people forget that sport, they, they, they can kind of blow it out of proportion a little bit. At its core, sport is entertainment. You know, we're here for a show, and De Silva put on an unbelievable show. But more importantly, the energy in the room is up. Everyone's excited, everyone's dancing a little bit. And I think guys like that can just uh, change a night, change the atmosphere, change an organization. Absolutely. Like a guy doing submission grappling dressed as a lumberjack, right? Yeah, exactly. You get it. Yeah. <laughs> look, fantastic stuff. We're going to take another look at what's coming up at UFC 287, coming your way in just a few weeks' time. Israel Adesanya, he has never been beaten at 185 pounds. But Alex Pajeda is the boogeyman to Israel Adesanya. Oh my goodness! Pereira's landed some really good shots. Nice left oh. hands from the challenger. Oh, oh he hurt him! He hurt him bad! At the buzzer! The champ's starting to open oh. up now. It seems like we're looking at about 3-1 pretty comfortably for the champion. Adesanya five minutes away from remaining the UFC standard at 185 pounds. But the danger is still there with Fajita. Oh, oh, he hurt him. He hurt him bad. Adesanya's on one way left. Oh, 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 my God. Down goes the champion. Oh, that's it. That's it. Him. He knocked me out, but this is my story, and it's about revenge. To be great, you gotta stand up when you fall. This is time for war. A fantastic night of mixed martial arts, Miami. Adesanya! This is an opportunity for him to get revenge and to show how great he truly is. But the Lux Fajita is a killer. They better come for me if you see me. I'll see you back. Put their hands on like just a stack. Ever been. Gilbert Garino burns! He's a real threat wherever he goes. He's going to be a lord. Crazy night. I cannot wait. Yeah. Victory is mine. Uh. Pereira versus Adesanya 2. I mean, their first fight for me, Dan, one of the most entertaining fights I've seen. And to see Pereira pull it out of the bag like that, absolutely wild. And that guy's an absolute monster in middleweight, right? He, he's absolutely terrifying. It was quite funny. I was watching that, that fight uh, on my phone 
live uh, on the way back from Rome. I had a super early flight, and um, I was waiting. I was the last person to get on the plane, and I was watching it. And you know, as you get on a plane, the signal goes. Uh, the signal goes as I get on the plane. At the beginning of the fifth round, I'm thinking, well, I know how this fight's gone anyway. I get off the plane in, in the UK, and I have a look, and suddenly Pereira's champion. What the hell just happened? So, yeah, I mean, a really, really entertaining match. Uh, and I think the, the, the next one, it, we're going to answer the question, does Pereira just have Izzy's number? Yeah, absolutely. The many fights uh, they've had over the years in kickboxing and now MMA. And look, you have to give Adesanya credit as well for taking this fight again so soon. Because this is go big or go home, right? If he loses to this guy again, it's tough to see a path back to the middleweight title for him unless Pereira goes up to 205, which, looking at the size of the guy, perhaps not out of the question. Yeah, I mean, I was very worried for Adesanya that Pereira was going to beat him, get the title, and then retire. <laughs> and Izzy would never have the shot again. So I'm really happy that he got the, the immediate rematch. I think he deserved the immediate rematch. You know, such a dominant champion. Uh, and, and the way that the fight went was so close up until that last round. Uh, yeah, this is a massive fight for, for, for Israel Adesanya. Um, it's going to be interesting. If he loses this, the question is, is he just going to become a bit of a journeyman in that middleweight division, not being able to, 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 to take out Pereira? But at the same time, Pereira's such an interesting character in terms of his fighting style because he's one that many guys that Adesanya's very comfortably beaten could probably beat Pereira in the wrestling, in the grappling. So we could find a really weird situation in the middleweight division. Like Pereira's come in, Adesanya's so dominant, so dominant in middleweight, and Pereira's come in and really thrown a spanner in that whole division. So very, very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, with, with the likes of Hamza waiting in the wings as well, potentially talking about uh, fighting for the middleweight title. Look, who knows what's going to happen in the UFC middleweight division. But we're here to find out what's going to happen in the Cage Warriors middleweight division. And we've got Gilham Kadena versus the former Cage Warriors middleweight champion, Matt the Beast Bonner. He had a few fights down uh, in the welterweight division at, at lower catch weights. He's moved back up now to middleweight, got a big win last time out here at Unplugged, and he's looking to keep that momentum up here tonight. Well, here's the weigh-in yesterday, though. And as we said earlier, Dan, these guys had a little bit of a push and shove. They had some words uh, for each other. They're going to settle it right now. Gilham Kadena will be in search of his 26th submission victory in our middleweight co-main event. He'll face former champion Matt the Beast Bonner. He'll be looking for another unplugged victory. So I fought Nathias Frederick for the belt. Uh, very tough fight on four rounds. I managed to finish him with a naked choke around the midpoint of the fourth round to become the Cage Warriors middleweight champion. Pues yo tengo 31 años. Empecé mi mía profesional a los 17 para 18. Tengo una carrera ahí bastante dura. Ha hecho muchas peleas. Ahora llevo 51 peleas profesionales. He has played with all kinds of people and I hope to give you a better spectacle this night. Last time I fought was at the BT Sports Studio against Alan Carlos. I managed to TKO him in the second round with a big left hook. And that was my first fight back at, back at middleweight and on the road to winning that middleweight title again. I learned this fight because I have played in a lower weight than the mine, but I need to train more. But well, this fight will be totally different. Uh, Kadena's got a really good skill set, very experienced, uh, very technical jiu-jitsu, probably the highest um, jiu-jitsu guy who I've ever, ever come up against. Very, very much looking forward to compete against him and see, see what his skill set is. Eh, Matt Borne is a very good fighter, he's a very good striker, he's a ex de ex-champion of the event, but there is no respect, I'm going for him. I have respect for a professional, but there is no respect for him. I'm going to win the I see Cadena gassing very early in the first round, about probably way pointing through the, to the first, and me finishing him off with a TKO. Le voy a matar, le voy a pegar, voy a finalizar. Voy a poner mi jiu-jitsu en práctica para el MMA y le voy a finalizar. Eso está a 6%. Well, here we go, ladies and gentlemen. It's our co main event of show one here at Cage Warriors Unplugged. And making his way to the cage for the second time in Cage Warriors, it's Gilham Warrior Cadena, representing his own team, Team Cadena Warrior, where he is the head coach. This guy has had a long tenure in the game. 31 and 20 is the record. Debut back in August of 2012. We first saw him on December uh, of last year. A debut against Darren Stewart, which isn't a pleasant prospect uh, for anyone lost 
by a TKO in the first round, but got a really quick turnaround. Had this fight booked, then uh, took a fight just a couple of weeks ago at the end of February. Got a quick first round submission in that one. And uh, he's here tonight to try and uh, right the wrong of his debut against Darren Stewart. Uh, and again, doing so against the highest level of competitor we've got in the middleweight division here at Cage Warriors in the former champ, Matt Bonham. He got a first round submission uh, in that fight that he took outside the promotion at the end of February. That makes it 25 submission wins in total as a pro for this man. Obviously competes in grappling as well, uh, has competed in bare boxing, so not just a pure grappler, this is a true, uh, a, a perhaps a journeyman in the truest sense of the word, and that he goes anywhere, fights anyone, any rules, any disciplines, and he's here to do that against Matt Bonner here tonight. Well, Edwin starts walk and they mean only one thing here at Cage Warriors and that is that it's time to unleash the beast. Matt Bonner making another walk to the Cage Warriors cage. And you see his brother Dan in the crowd there. Very confusing when Dan's in the crowd and Matt's fighting. Incredible resemblance between the two Bonner boys. Dan himself, uh, Professional Thai boxer. I, I must have mentioned him before on commentary, Dan, but I remember many, many years ago when these two guys were doing amateur MMA. I called their fights, they fought one after the other. And pretty much, uh, uh, Matt didn't have his tattoos then. And I think they had the same color shorts as well. So I was very, very confused for a while. I thought they had some ringer in fighting twice. But though both guys have gone on to uh, great success in their respective fields. And of course, Matt, the former Cage Warriors middleweight champion, had a few fights at lower weights, but he's back at middleweight. This is where he feels his home is. This is where he's had the most success. A big knockout against Al Carlos last November and unplugged. And he's looking to follow that up here tonight against Guillem Cadena. And of course, that bad blood at the weigh-ins yesterday. Let's see if it spills over into the fight as we take a look at the tail of the tape. 13, 8, and 1 plays 31 and 22 veteran records. Only 31 years old with over 50 pro fights is Cadena. 32 is Matt Bonner. He's going to have a slight height advantage standing 6 1 to Cadena's 5 10. Cadena coming in slightly under. Bonner coming in at championship weight for this one. He's got the championship in the back of his mind. Let's see if he can get past Galen Cadena here as our man in the cage, Mr. Howell Chaplin, gets this one on the way. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your co-main event of the evening, taking place in the Cage Warriors middleweight division and brought to you by Apex Fightwear. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner. He stands by feet 10 inches tall. Official weight, 184.2 pounds. He is fighting out of Salamanca, Spain, by way of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and brings into the cage a professional record of 31 wins with 20 defeats. Introducing Gilham Warrior Cantina. Standing opposite him in the cage, fighting out of the red corner. He stands six feet one inch tall. Official weight, 185 pounds even. He is fighting out of Warrington in England and brings into the cage a professional record of 13 wins, eight defeats and one draw. And trying just to tell you, Matt, the Beast Bonner. Your referee in charge of the action begins, Mr. Leon Roberts. Referee Leon Roberts about to get this one underway. Three five minute rounds if they need them in the Cage Warriors middleweight division. Guillaume Warrior Cadena in the white. Matt the Beast Bonner in the burgundy. Gentlemen, first round. You ready? You ready? Let's go. First of three underway. We do get a touch of gloves here. And you know, this is what this fight is really going to be about is can, can Cadena get Bonner onto the ground? 
I mean, Bonner knows exactly what Cadena's going for, but is he going to be successful in defending it? I mean, right now, Cadena is on this leg, you know, opting to almost pull guard in position here. And sometimes when, when, when you have such an advantage with someone on the ground, you're quite comfortable. We've seen it at the very highest level with top, top grapplers. They'll be quite happy to, to actually pull a half guard position, use it to sweep to get on top and then attack from there. You never really want to work, uh, you know, it's a very rarely uh, a, a situation where you actively want to work off your back, but often they'll give up the uh, top position in order to get a sweep. So far, Bond are doing a pretty good job here. You can see him controlling him with his right arm, the left arm of Cadena. He doesn't want him uh, to allow him to uh, connect the hands or switch to a, a double leg here, pick up you know, something like that, picking up the ankle. You can see the right arm of Bonner framing on the bicep there. They try and keep that arm at distance. And there's a very good job of shrugging off that takedown attempt. And that's really what it's going to come down to, especially in this first round, you know, where this fight is going to take place. Can Bonner keep it on the feet? And there you go to see what I said, this guard pull here. And actually happy to go into a full guard position. Oh, big elbows from Bonner there. Trying to cut an angle for an arm bar here. Bonner's going to be careful, but he's raining down those heavy blows. And one thing we know about Bonner is he can generate a phenomenal amount of force with his ground and pound. Very, very heavy handed. And he's cut Cadena here, I believe. Yeah, Cadena does not want to be on his back here. You know, Bonner's going to be very, very difficult to tie up in a submission. I mean, if anyone could do it, it would be Cadena with his submission. Toes out of cage, toes out of cage. Great spot from Leon Roberts there. Cadena just warned for having his toes in the cage. And this Bonner is right in front of his own corner team here. Apologies, Dan, for cutting Gobi there. Right in front of the next-gen team. Doing a great job of just pounding away on Cadena here. Very nice ground and pound, and referee's having a good look here, covering up. I mean, not a huge amount of intelligent defense there, and Bonner almost looked like he relented a little bit there and allowed his opponent to get back to the feet. But you can imagine that is going to be thinking twice about pulling guard again because no success with it first time. I mean, this is a classic classic strategy where it's not a guard pull, but, you know, you haven't closed the distance, but if you go for a shot and it fails because you're so confident that your opponent's not going to follow you to the ground, you just sit down cool. and really... Bonner lighting Cadena up on the on the feet there. Another guard pull into butterfly guard this time. Yeah, some big shots from the beast on the feet there. And I think we're going to happy to go back to the ground panel. We could be seeing the ground panel finish here. This is going to be over soon, I think. Not a lot of defense, intelligent defense here. And it's over. There we go. Another big TKO for the beast. Uh, I believe Cadena was briefly protesting it, but like, you can't take too many shots from Matt Bonner like that. I mean, I just don't, the question really is, is if it had gone on any longer, would he have taken any fewer shots? And I don't think that's the case. I think Bonner was, I mean, the question is, was he intelligently defending himself? And I just don't feel that he was in that position. I mean, would it just been another five, six, seven, ten more shots with those massive, you know, sledgehammer hands of Matt Bonner on top? Yeah, and, you know, speaking to Matt this week, he said, as far as he can remember, this is actually the best ever uh, weight cut he's ever had. He said he didn't feel drained at all. He said he got all the weight off in one bath. So we know Bonner would have been able to sit there and throw those heavy shots for the rest of that round and the second and the third if need be. Yeah, I, I, I just think from the beginning, Cadena's uh, strategy just, you know, he was not able to implement his game plan at all. We saw a few takedown attempts. He had no success with getting on top. I think if he was able to get to a top position, it could have got very interesting. We have seen Bonner struggle with some uh, opponents in the past when he's underneath uh, uh, on the ground. Uh, but from top positions, he's just very, very composed. He knows exactly what he's doing. His ground and pound is very heavy. It's very precise. And Cadena just wasn't able to get to top position on the ground. He opted to pull guard a couple of times. With both, both times that he did it, he just got punished very, very badly. And I don't think that we would have seen much different uh, if we let this fight go on a little bit longer. No, and, and I mean, these shots, are, they're all getting around the gloves as well. So, you know, there's not even an argument for the fact that he was blocking these. He wasn't. Uh, and, and look, you know, Cadena, a fantastic record with all those submission wins, but, you know, 12 TKO losses coming into this one, 13 now. Uh, it's obviously a deficit in his game, and Matt Bonner able to uh, really take advantage of, of those gaps tonight here and unplug. Grinding out that TKO victory. Really able to generate a lot of power with those short shots is Bonner. 
And here's the reaction, Ellis Hampson and Paul Rimmer from Next Generation in the corner. Very happy with their man's work. And Cadena's corner here. Clear frustration from the veterans corner. And Cadena just looking a, a bit dejected there. But look, that's a big win for Matt Bonner. And another step closer to returning to the Cage Warriors middleweight title. Here's Mr. Howell Chaplin to make it official. Ladies and gentlemen, your referee, Mr. Leon Roberts, calls a stop to this contest after just two minutes and 54 seconds of the very first round, declaring your winner by way of TKO. In the red corner, Matt the Beast Bonner! Matt the Beast Bonner going all the way up in the Cage Warriors middleweight division. Two in a row, and unplugged, and two emphatic finishes. The first over Alan Carlos, a storied veteran in his own right. And now a big win over the incredibly experienced Galam Cadena. Phenomenal stuff from the beast. And look, you've got to believe now, maybe he's the next guy to fight for the Cage Warriors middleweight title. We've got a huge uh, main event coming up on show two. That middleweight title is going to be decided and it's going to be Will Curry against an old opponent of uh, Matt Bonner's in, uh, in Mick Stanton. So uh, who knows what the outcome of that one's going to be, but Matt Bonner is surely going to be sat here backstage tonight with one eye on that fight, Dan. Yeah, 100%. I mean, this was just vintage Bonner, wasn't it? He just looked so composed, uh, so in control. Uh, you know, again, that Terminator coming forward, relentless, very, uh, a lot of power in those hands, just really clinically done. And yeah, he's got to be thinking about, you know, you're in the division, you're always looking for that, to reclaim that belt. And uh, I think he's going to have a really, really keen eye on the uh, main event of our second show tonight. Absolutely. I mean, that's a perfect way to describe it, that Terminator. Uh, when I ever think of those kind of performances from Bonner, I think about that fight with Matt Inman. Very different fight to what we saw there. Inman, obviously, uh, a phenomenal submission artist in his own right, but but an incredible striker. And those two just had a punch up. Yeah. And it was it was the the the, te the technique and the slickness of Inman against the the very disciplined boxing and the jab. And, and every time those shots landed, there was just a thud. Like whether it was a jab, whether it was a straight. And Bonner kept coming forward, and Inman kept coming forward. That there was a clash for the ages. If you've not seen it. Get on UFC Fight Pass tonight after the show's over. Look for Inman versus Bonner. You will not be disappointed. Uh, an absolute corker of a fight. But look, Matt Bonner right back up there at the top of the division now. And, you know, let's talk about our main event coming up on show two, uh, which is for the middleweight title. We've got Mick Stanton, a true war dog of the game, a guy who's been around for years, a guy who's fought everybody against a man who many think is the young, up-and-coming next big thing in Will Curry. Well, I mean, Will Curry is one of my favorite guys to watch. He's a fantastic, he kind of, you, you see him, you go, this guy's gonna be the super dynamic striker and he's got that. But actually what we see from Will Curry the most is fantastic grappling. I mean, a, a really great submission artist in Will Curry. I'm really looking forward to this fight, uh, our main event in the, on, on our second show tonight. Uh, but yeah, this is gonna be an interesting one. I mean, the only person that Will Curry has lost to is uh, Christian Leroy Duncan. Those two times, both really interesting fights. You know, controversial on the first one, close on the second one. Um, so. I think that this is going to be, this is a very good title fight, and I think it's going to be interesting to see who we get going against uh, the winner of this moving forward. Well, this is the interesting thing, Dan. You, you brought it up there about Christian Leroy Duncan. Obviously, we've just seen Christian go on uh, to the UFC. Uh, not the debut performance he would have wanted, obviously, with, with his opponent getting an injury, but, you know, his opponent hadn't laid a hand on him. He looked like he was well in control of that fight. It shows, again, the progression of the guys who win these titles in Cage Warriors and go on to do great things in the UFC. There's going to be a bit of extra drive for Will Curry because, as you say, he, he's the guy that uh, Christian Lee Roy Duncan beat early on in their careers. You know, maybe a fight we wouldn't have seen if it wasn't such extraordinary times uh, as, as the pan pandemic era where, where guys were just having to fight whoever was available because, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't fly guys in necessarily from all over the world. So they met very early, and it's surely going to be at the back of Will's mind. I've got to chase Christian Lee Roy Duncan to the UFC and get that rematch maybe down the line. Yeah, I mean, imagine us seeing that rematch again a few years down the line in sort of the top rankings of the UFC. I mean, Will's got to be thinking that he's young. Uh, you know, he, 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 he's he got the, the looks of a fighter. The guy's just jacked. He looks like he's ready to step on a bodybuilding stage at a moment's notice. 
He's, he's a really entertaining fighter uh, and he's incredibly skilled. I think he's got a really bright future. Um, yeah, so I think uh, the main goal for him tonight is winning the title. Uh, over the next couple of years, I imagine, would be looking to get to the UFC and maybe later down the line, maybe trying to get that rematch. Absolutely. And, you know, here we see both guys warming up backstage. And, you know, we, we need to talk about Mick Stanton as well. Yeah. This is a guy who's been around the block. He, he's been he's been there. He, he's done it all. He's seen it all. Incredibly fought. You know, we were talking about this before we came on air, Dan. And Mick Stanton's fought for the middleweight title before, but he did so in the most unusual of circumstances. He was competing in a welterweight contest. He turned up to the weigh-ins. His opponent did not make it. I don't remember the exact reason off the top of my head, but he was essentially sat dejected after weighing in, so he'd get paid his purse, and he weighed in at 170, and he was sat dejected uh, in, in the weighing room, watching the other fighters weigh in. In the middleweight title fight that was the main event that evening, the champion came in way overweight, lost his belt on the scales, and did not want to fight. So all of a sudden, Cage Warriors on 24 hours uh, did not have that middleweight title main event. Mick Stanton in the back of the room put his hand up and said, I'll take it, I'll do it. And, and that takes incredible fortitude when you've weighed in at a division below to take on a huge middleweight in Jonas Bilstein, who at the time was one of the top ranked middleweights in Europe. Uh, and Stanton went out there, he didn't win that fight, but he put it on Bilstein. And uh, Bilstein had said, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll stand and bang with this guy. He got tagged a few times and he shot for that takedown pretty quick, <laughs> let me tell you. But that speaks to the fortitude of Mick Stanton, the, the fact that mentally he's tough enough to do something like that on such short notice and the fact that he's had so many of these long, uh, drawn-out fights, he's been able to use that cardio and the much-improved wrestling and grappling that we've seen, which we also talked about earlier on. Uh, and we believe that his key to winning this fight is taking it into deep water with that grappling. Yeah, 100%. I mean, we've seen uh, in, in, in Mick's last couple of fights, yeah, he's, he's training at ASW now, the wrestling's coming on, he's got that physicality, he's got that doggedness, he's got that tenacity, that cardio, and I think that it plays in quite nicely to, to the game of Will Curry. You know, Will is someone who is a maybe one of the best quick starters. In, 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 in that I've seen in Cage Warriors. The guy comes out, he's dynamic with his striking, he's dynamic with his grappling, he's dangerous in that first round. But what we tend to see is, once it goes past the first round, that energy starts to deplete a little bit. So this is gonna be very interesting seeing him in five rounds um, against someone who we know can go the distance. So I think uh, early, it's gonna be Will Curry. But if Mick can drag this into the later rounds, I think it could be a long night for Will. And it has to be said, going into this fight, Mick Stanton coming off the back of a title fight on the regional scene against a young, hungry, undefeated up-and-comer, which he won via TKO in the fourth round after wearing his man down. So, you know, potentially that's something that, that we need to look out for. But look, what else we need to look out for tonight is our main event of show one. It's Prince McLean, the US veteran, taking on the young up-and-comer from Team Renegade, Matty Byfield. Win or lose, American veteran Prince McLean has never been to a decision. He'll face Matty Byfield, a teammate of UFC champion Leon Edwards, who'll be looking to ride that wave of momentum here tonight. Streak, I won my first Cage Warriors fight through TKO 